Hello everyone, this is John Mark Johnson Jr. again, host of Relationship and Truth. And today we're going to go over Lord's Day 5 in the Heidelberg Catechism. This is beginning the second section of the Heidelberg Catechism, the section on deliverance. Previously we've been going over, we've gone over the introduction uh, to the, the Heidelberg Catechism, then we went over the first section which was on human misery, and now we're starting in to how do we address the miserable state of mankind. That's what we're going to be getting into today in Lord's Day 5. And for those of you who don't know, this is a part of a broader series that we're doing. This particular series is on the Heidelberg Catechism. I'm going to take a year and basically go through the whole thing. Um, but I'm also doing a series on the Canons of Dort and the Belgian Confession of Faith. The reason why I'm doing it is for partially for myself, because I'm joining the United Reformed Churches of North America, and they use these three documents called the Three Forms of Unity. So I'm doing it for me, but I'm also doing it for you guys, so that you can know and understand what the early Protestants thought and believed. And in so much as these documents are also based on canonical scripture, the earliest, most authoritative sources of the faith, you also get an idea of what original Christianity was all about. Alright, so without any further ado, let's go ahead and get into Lord's Day 5. Question 12 it says, According to God's righteous judgment, we deserve punishment, both now and in eternity. How, then, can we escape this punishment and return to God's favor? Good question. We just got over the, got, and went through the section on misery and said, yeah, we are absolutely terrible in God's sight. He is holy, we are not. He is just, we are not. He is true, we are not. Our nature is totally corrupt, and God, the just judge, has every right to punish that which is corrupt in us, that which is totally depraved in us. Is there a way of escape? That's what question is and is saying, how can we possibly escape this? This is a miserable state. We deserve punishment, both now and in eternity. How can we get out of that? Is it possible even? And the answer that is given is this. God requires that his justice be satisfied. Therefore, the claims of this justice must be paid in full, either by ourselves or by another. And this is a very interesting thing in Christian theology and doctrine in general that would diff be different from other religions. In Christian doctrine and theology, God's justice never goes unsatisfied. God cannot simply forgive. God can forgive, but he cannot simply forgive in the sense of uh, foregoing justice. God will never forgo justice, even when he forgives. he will still execute justice because God is in uh, the order of things. He is first just, he is first true, he is first righteous, and then he is loving and forgiving. But his justice must be satisfied first. If his justice was such that he could just simply overlook things from time to time, frankly, Christianity wouldn't exist. Uh, not as we know it now, for sure. And the problem that we have in the world simply wouldn't exist as we have it now. Why would God put us in the penal colony Earth where we are being held uh, for our future eternal execution, basically? And not in the sense of being done away with altogether, but being sent to our eternal destination. Uh, which, and the eternal destination that we all deserve, is to be forever tormented in the lake of fire. Uh, why are we being held at all in this temporary place um, that is in itself a place that is not optimal? Why are we being held in a penal colony if God can just simply, to, simply decide to forgive without requiring that justice be done? Um, how can we kind of decide, well, I'm going to forgive these ones over here, and I'm never even going to send them into penal colony earth. I'm going to send them some other place 
that will be much more pleasant because I've decided to forgive them. No, the fact is that God requires justice. And what he wants us to know first and foremost about him is his holiness, is his righteousness, is the fact that we have violated his standards. That is why he sends everyone to penal colony earth rather than some other place. It's because he wants all of us to know and to understand that we are indeed under his wrath. God's justice comes logically prior to his love and grace. And this is absolutely essential for a right understanding of the Bible and certainly for Reformed doctrine and theology. The holiness of God cannot uh, be underestimated and it cannot be usurped by God's love. Yes, God is loving, but his love does not do away with his righteousness. It does not do away with his righteous judgment. His righteous judgment must be satisfied regardless of whether or not he's going to show love. The justice has to be satisfied. And so, the claims of this justice, that is what the justice of God would hold against us, the punishments that it would hold against us, those punishments have to be paid in full, either by ourselves or by another. Question 13. Can we make this payment for ourselves? That's a good question. Okay, so if God's justice requires these certain punishments, is it possible for us to, you know, basically pay the fine and then get out? And the answer is certainly not. Actually, we increase our debt every day. And this is the problem. We, as we've discussed before, we are sinners by nature which means that even if you could have paid for all of your sins up until this point, you still have a problem. You're a sinner who sins by nature, which means that even if you've paid for all the sins up to this point, which, which in and of itself would still be a problem, you still have the problem that your fundamental nature hasn't been taken care of. You are still a rebel. And no matter how many good things a rebel does, it doesn't change the fact that he's a rebel. Um, to use a, another analogy, let's imagine that you are looking at a bunch of people on death row. And let's say that, uh, you know, this is these are all people who have been justly condemned, all committed heinous crimes uh, that the legal system has deemed worthy of the death sentence. They're all, you know, on death row um, awaiting their crime. Uh, sorry, awaiting the punishment for their crime. And let's uh, say that one of these people decides that he's somehow going to make it right. And he gets the, uh, the family of the victim, um, of the person that he wronged in some way, whether he killed that person or raped that person, whatever it was to, to get the death sentence, he manages to make it up to these people in some way uh, such that they lift the, the death sentence on him. Great, it's wonderful. You know, whether he bought his way out of it or, or whatever, but he was able to find some way to get out of the repercussions of the initial crime that got him into the place. But let's say that this person is maybe a murderer by nature, a rapist by nature. And so as soon as he gets out, what does he do? He goes and he does the same thing again. And guess where he winds up? Again. Until his nature is taken care of, having all the means of payment in the world isn't going to solve the problem because he's always going to wind up landing back in the same spot. If we even could pay for our sins ourselves, we still have the problem of a broken nature to deal with. And until that broken nature is fixed, guess what? We're going to keep winding up in the same spot. And this is part of the problem of Roman Catholicism. Roman Catholicism is nothing but a treadmill of works. 
And the reason why is because, by and large, you're dealing with a bunch of people who have the same fundamental problem. They're all sinners. And guess what? Even if after they get baptized, even after they go through the Roman Catholic Catechism, the Universal Catechism of the Church, even after they uh, partake of the sacraments, guess what? They still are going to be sinners. And if you have a system that does not have perfect salvation, you're going to wind up with a system that has imperfect salvation or you're consistently trying to be re-cleansed all the time, which is exactly what Roman Catholicism does. They realize that we're sinners and that we keep on sinning. And so what they keep saying is, well, you need to be re-cleansed and re-cleansed and re-cleansed and re-cleansed. Well, how do you know if, after you got cleansed the last time that you're not going to go out and do something in the next two seconds that will undo what you just accomplished? And that is the problem in Roman Catholicism. You know, if you're going to die, it better be right after you go to confessional. That would be a good time to die. But if you wait too long and you've done too much, eh, well, you know, purgatory is always waiting. Or worse, if you can murder a mortal sin, then hey, you're just going to hell. Roman Catholicism has part of the truth. We are sinful by nature, which means that our sins are going to be something that we keep coming back to. We are going to keep sinning. The problem, though, is that they don't have a perfect Savior, and because of that, that ongoing process of sin can never be uh, fully atoned for in their system. Only what you've done up until that point, basically. What the Bible, though, offers is a perfect Savior who can take care of past, present, and future sins. But we're not quite there yet. Question 14. Can another creature, any at all, pay this debt for us? And this is very important wording. It says creature. Can any other created thing pay this debt for us? So we just said, can we make this payment ourselves? And the answer is no, because we're going to keep sinning and keep adding to our debts. On a basic level, that is true. Now, there's also another thing that isn't talked about here, but it is worth considering, and that is the basic fact that we are... Uh, not only do we keep committing specific acts of sin, but because we have that nature that leads to those specific acts of sin, we have a condemnable nature. If you're dealing with someone who will not, cannot be changed, there is no atonement that can be made for them. If a person is innately, by nature, a rebel against the throne of the king of the universe, a rebel against God, and that is the only thing that they will ever in themselves ever be, there is um, no human payment that can be offered for that. Because without a change in nature, there is nothing that can be done. All right, so can any other creature, so can another creature, any at all, pay this debt for us? Any other created thing? We can't pay it ourselves. Maybe some other created thing can pay this debt for us, and the answer is no. No. To begin with, God will not punish any other creature for what a human is guilty of. Furthermore, no mere creature can bear the weight of God's eternal wrath against sin and deliver others from it. Let's begin with the last part for uh, first here. No mere creature can bear the weight of God's eternal wrath against sin and deliver others from it. Like I said, it's not the fact that we simply continue to sin that it's a problem. It's the problem that we have a rebel's nature, that we are in ourselves and of ourselves permanently disposed to rebel against God. And because of that, that is an eternal wrath for something that is in itself unchangeable, that deserves wrath, it will always deserve wrath. Okay. When people are sent to hell, when people are sent to the lake of fire, they're not going to stop sinning. They're not going to stop being rebels against the king of the universe. They're not going to stop rebelling against God's throne. They're not going to stop uh, loving unrighteousness. They're not going to stop loving their sin. 
they are going, they are by nature disposed to what is evil. It is never going to leave them, and because of that, there's an eternal wrath against them. They, in and of themselves, are eternally rebellious, and because of that, God's wrath is eternally against them. And because it is eternal, there is no creature, no created thing that can bear that weight. Because we're literally talking about an eternity of rebellion, which means an eternity of punishment. No one can bear that in a moment. No creature, I should say, can bear that in a moment. It does not happen. It does not work. And then going back up to the first one, it says that God will not punish any other creature for what a human is guilty of. And this is actually a very important point in uh, Protestant theology in general, and especially Reformed Protestant theology. When it comes to, uh, say, the sacrifices of the Old Testament, Reformed people do not believe that those sacrifices actually ever cleared someone of sin in uh, the salvific sense. Now, that doesn't mean that they didn't have a ceremonial function and that they were made ceremonially, or, uh, ceremonially pure by performing these acts, uh, so on and so forth. But we do not believe that anyone was actually saved by any sacrifice that was offered. Now, these sacrifices prefigure uh, what would be necessary for mankind. They display God's anger and his wrath, and they ceremonially separate the people of God from the people around them. But in and of themselves, they cannot save anyone. And frankly, even the Old Testament talks about the fact that these things are not ultimately what saves anyone. Okay, This is clear even from Old Testament scripture. This isn't something that's based just on New Testament. This is Old Testament scripture as well. That even at the time it was understood that these sacrifices in and of themselves are not what ultimately saves me. And there was that understanding in the Old Testament. Unfortunately, though, a lot of Protestants today think that God's method of salvation has changed with time. But back in the Old Testament, um, you could save yourself by offering a sacrifice. But now, Christ has died for us, so we don't have to uh, offer sacrifices anymore. And that's how people look at it. Biblically speaking, that's not true. And historically speaking, as far as what Protestants have believed, that's not true. Protestants have believed what the Bible says, and that is that um, the blood of bulls and goats and sheep and all these other sacrificial animals could never save uh, someone. They could make someone ceremonial, ceremonially clean and for a time, but they could never uh, solve the problem that mankind has before a holy, righteous God. God's method of salvation has always been the same. We are saved by God, which is manifested in faith and repentance, which leads to the actions of righteous, holy men who do things out of gratitude, who, because they are now free in God, they will, with gratitude, be able to do what is righteous in God's sight, which is not to say that they'll be perfect in God's sight, but they will do ever increasingly more of what is indicative of God and less and less of what is indicative of the fallen human nature. But God's method of salvation has never changed. It's always been at his discretion, and it's been manifested in faith and repentance. And it has never been the case that mankind could save himself by doing anything by offering a sacrifice, by paying a fine, by anything. He cannot save himself in the sense of being right before the holy throne of God. There are things that man could do to be ceremonially pure. There are things that man could do uh, to be uh, 
and good standing in the community, so on and so forth. But before the whole holy righteous requirements of God, no. There's nothing that man can do, and there's no creature that he can put his, um, his eternal guilt on and be saved. And that's the same in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. It didn't change. The Old Testament had uh, particular administrations in it that were specifically for the people of Israel to prefigure what would happen in Christ, but those things did not actually save anyone. And that distinction is very, very important of. God will never accept um, punishment of what is less for what is more. It says God will not punish any other creature for what a human is guilty of. Human guilt is different. Um, in fact, it's only humans and higher created beings, angels, demons, those kinds of things that could actually have any guilt at all. And that they are the ones that have um, a truly eternal soul. And they are the ones who are made for a specific relationship with God, whereas, frankly, the plants and the animals are not. There's a completely different level of created order in those things. And because of that, one cannot substitute for the other. If we're going to deal with the problem of the human guilt, of the human debt, it has to be dealt, on that, dealt with on that level or higher, nothing less. Then again, the answer goes on to talk about the eternal wrath of God. So even if we do talk about a higher creature, like an angel, um, an angel still cannot bear the eternal wrath of uh, God against sin, because even though angels are supernatural, they are not eternal in the sense that God is eternal. They're not capable of bearing the eternal wrath that God is capable of giving. It just simply can't be done. This is actually a major problem with the Jehovah's Witnesses, for example. The Jehovah's Witnesses believe that Jesus is basically a, another version. It's not exactly not exactly the same as, but basically another version of uh, Michael the, Arch, the Archangel. And so what they believe happened is that Jesus, as an angel, not, not as the God-man, but as an angel, died for them. But that would be a creature. An angel is a created thing. And so what they're basically saying is that a created thing, something that is not eternal in the sense that God is eternal, not nearly at that level, somehow died in our place. Now, I'm not exactly what the Jehovah's Witnesses um, theory of atonement is, exactly how far it extends and how it works. Um, but as far as I understand it, they do have some kind of a sense of atonement. And what they're saying as far as I can understand it, is that a creature bore God's eternal wrath, which does not make any sense at all. It does not make sense that a being that is infinitely below God and all created beings are infinitely below God could bear his eternal wrath. That doesn't work. All right, so that is question 14. Can another creature, any at all, pay this debt for us? No, no created thing can do this. For the lower beings, um, there's simply not an equivalence uh, there. It's at a different level. For the higher beings, you still have the problem of the eternal wrath and also uh, the fact that um, the guilt of humanity is at that specific level and will remain at the level of the guilt of humanity. Okay, so, yeah, it doesn't work. One way or the other, created beings cannot pay this debt. The lower beings, plants and animals, are too low. And the higher beings are still not high enough. Question 15. What kind of mediator and deliverer should we look for then? Answer. One who is a true and righteous man. Humankind is the object of this wrath. It is humankind that needs to be redeemed. So it is humankind 
that has to pay this debt. Yet, one more powerful than all creatures, that is one who is also true God. So will God accept the sacrifice of any other creature but a human in place of human sin? The answer is no. But can any human bear the weight of God's eternal wrath? No. So you have to have one who is truly human, and you also have to have one who is not created, the, someone who is capable of ex accepting the full eternal wrath of God, which means you have to have God. He is the only one who is big enough to handle the problem. All right, so that is Lord's Day 5. We're finally in the section on deliverance. We're getting there. We're getting there ever, ever, ever more closely. Um, but definitely looking forward to this. Much, much happier things to be thinking of than the, the section we were in on, which was the section on misery. Much, much better to be thinking of our deliverance. And so far, it still doesn't seem super positive because we're saying, well, okay, so how can we be delivered? Well, God's justice would have to be satisfied and paid in full by ourselves or another. That's not a pleasant thought. Can we pay this debt? No, because we actually keep on sinning. So if we paid it at one point, it wouldn't pay for what comes next. And if you don't have any perfect salvation, then you wind up with this treadmill of works, which is where Roman Catholicism has gone. So that creates problems. Um, and then we still have the, the basic question, okay, if we can't pay our own debt because we keep on sinning, we have a, a sinful nature that's again against God, well, maybe can another creature uh, pay this debt for us? What about the plants and the animals? There are plenty of them, and they don't have the, the same uh, problems of nature that we do. Uh, they don't actually really sin in the sense that you know, we do. God did not create them with uh, the capacity for communion with him and all the responsibility that goes along with that in those so they don't have that burden of the sinful nature that we do maybe they could be a substitute well no they can't uh, for one god is not going to punish a non-human for the sins of humanity and then also there's another problem of these are too low on the totem pole these creatures are not at the level of humans and because of that their life is not equivalent their sacrifice is not equivalent and it never has been the case that they were. Yes, there are Old Testaments that were required by God in the Old Testament, but not for salvific, uh, salvation in the ultimate eternal sense. Yes, they did have a ceremonial role. They did have a prefiguring role. Um, they did make one uh, right in the sight of the community, so on and so forth. But they did not actually save anyone in God's sight. No mere creature can do this, and especially not a lower creature. And then we went on and said, what about other creatures? Well, the first one answered other creatures. The Bible makes it clear that human sin is the human problem, whether it be higher creatures or lower creatures. Human sin is a human problem. But even if we wanted to talk about the greater creatures, angels, demons, those kinds of things, uh, we still have the problem of the infinite wrath of God. Mankind, by nature, is infinitely evil. He will always be evil throughout all eternity, meaning the eternity uh, that God uh, will... the eternal nature of that sin will be meted out by God on that sacrifice in that moment, and there's no creature that can bear that eternal weight. Not even angels could bear it. And so what kind of a, a deliverer do we look for? Well, God isn't going to punish a non-human for a human problem, so it has to be a human, but humans in and of themselves cannot take the infinite eternal wrath of God, so we also have to have true God. All right, so that is Lord's Day 5. Thank you very much for watching and listening. For those of you who are in Christ, Go with God and be blessed. For those of you who are not, I pray that you come to an understanding of the true Christ of history, the only genuine Savior of mankind. Amen.